Bonjour, Kinemage and Nene Ireland, Adigenikas, and welcome to this edition of Social Studies Explorer. Today's edition, Chapter 6, Section 4, Declaring Independence. We'll begin in our Michigan Open Book, our Section 4 text, beginning on page 137, if you're using the PDF version that's attached in the Google Classroom. And we start out with a question here. Have you ever read something so powerful that it changed your mind? Have you ever felt frustrated that others did not understand your viewpoint? Chances are you probably are saying yes to both of those questions. And um, we do have some vocabulary, a petition, it's where a group of people sign on to a request. A declaration is a statement, a declarative sentences in grammar. And treason is when you take up arms or provide aid and comfort to the enemy of a nation. Throughout the next few sections, you will read about some very important documents that played an important role in history after the first battles of the Revolutionary War. The colonists did not want this war to continue and sent a petition to King George, as well as writing what we now know as the Declaration of Independence. You will learn about a document called Common Sense by Thomas Paine. It convinced many that were still loyal to King George to join the Patriots cause and wise up to whom the loyalists really were. Finally, you will read about how the words Thomas Jefferson wrote in the Declaration about all men are created equal did not apply to the role of African Americans, women, and American Indians, but was an ideal of human life. Apparently an ideal that only applied to, well, white guys. The Olive Branch Petition. On July 5th, 1775, Congress sent a petition, also known as a written request, to King George III. This was shortly after the Battle of Bunker Hill and a way to patch things up with him. It was called the Olive Branch Petition. An olive branch is a symbol of peace. It begged the king for a happy and permanent reconciliation. The king refused, calling the colonists rebels and making him more determined than before to continue to punish the colonists. Common sense. A few months after the Olive Branch Petition, an Englishman, Thomas Paine, who had recently arrived in the American colonies, wrote a powerful pamphlet titled Common Sense. He wrote that gaining independence from Great Britain was the only way to prevent and stop Britain from abusing the colonists' rights. His pamphlet sold over 100,000 copies, an astonishing number in the 1700s. Many believed that the pamphlet convinced many colonists that independence was best. Listen to and read some of the words that Thomas Paine wrote. What do you think? How do you think he changed the minds of so many who remained loyal to King George? see the original common sense pamphlet go to the library of congress and there's a link here and if you put your mouse over the link and you hold down the control key that's a ctrl and then hit that it'll open up this document you can see an actual copy here and i can scroll in here just a little bit so that's kind of cool Another thing provided here, click on this brief clip to learn more about common sense. Yeah, I'll play that video for you. The sun never shined on a cause of greater worth. Tis not the concern of a day, a year, or an age. Posterity will be affected even to the end of time. The writer of those words was an Englishman who had immigrated to the New World only a few months before the clash at Lexington and Concord. He was self-educated and penniless. At age 38, Thomas Paine had been a tutor, tobacconist, grocer, and corset maker. And he had failed at everything except troublemaking. While he was in London, he enjoyed taking on everyone as a kind of uh, 18th century Socrates. He was in the marketplace arguing with everybody. 
He became a tax collector, was fired from his job when he was uh, caught handing out petitions to members of parliament asking for higher pay for the tax collectors. In London, Payne's appeals on behalf of underpaid civil servants caught the attention of Benjamin Franklin, who was there as an agent for several colonies. After meeting Payne, Franklin recommended him as an ingenious, worthy young man and sponsored his immigration to America. Once in Philadelphia, Payne began to write a pamphlet promoting the radical idea of American independence. Thomas Paine had suffered all his life under England's class system, and he spared no venom in his writing. In January of 1776, after virtually every typesetter in Philadelphia had refused to touch his treasonous work, a rebel printer finally agreed to publish it. Common Sense was its down-to-earth title. In its 47 pages, Paine attacked the notion that England's king should be seen as apparent to the American colonists. He set out to dethrone the sacred institution of monarchy. When it came out, Common Sense sold 120,000 copies in the first three months. And over the course of several years, it sold half a million copies. This was the equivalent, or almost the equivalent, of the Bible. Common Sense was read aloud from street corners and pulpits, in taverns, parlors, and schools. The brilliant pamphlet was published anonymously. People speculated it had been written by Samuel Adams, John Adams, or even Benjamin Franklin. Tom Paine was saying in this pamphlet what a lot of people were now thinking but had hardly dared to say out loud. In other words, that the colonists were at war with England. The Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Thomas Jefferson spent about two weeks writing and rewriting this document. The first part of the declaration explains why the colonists, the colonies had to, the right to separate from Britain. The second part listed violations that Britain had committed against the colonies. And the third and final part stated that the colonies only choice would be to be free from Britain. On July 2nd, 1776, the delegates voted the 13 colonies to be free and independent states. Two days later, they voted to approve the Declaration of Independence. The first part of the Declaration contains beliefs on which our country is founded. People born with certain rights, which include life, liberty, and the right to seek happiness, which is usually read as the pursuit of happiness. Two, people have the right to form their own government which they should choose, and its purpose should be to protect the rights of the citizens. And three, if the government fails to protect people's rights, people have the right to change it. On July 4th, 1776, hmm, what day do we do fireworks on in July? Hmm, can't remember. Congress officially approved the Declaration of Independence. Two months later, in total silence, the signers gathered, knowing they were committing treason, a revolt against the government. The penalty for this crime was death by hanging. John Hancock famously signed the document first. What is unique about his signature below? And you can see the signature here in the student version of the activity. But I'll show you that document. Let's take a peek at this picture of the Declaration of Independence. If you're interested in seeing it in person, it is available um, at the um, National Archives in Washington, DC. And let's actually listen to the video clip right here of the Declaration of Independence being read by celebrities. Unfortunately, not Miss Bickerman or I. They, they went with the B list today. When, in the
the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government. Laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. He has refused his assent to laws the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. He has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance unless suspended in their operation till his assent should be obtained. And when so suspended, he has utterly neglected to attend to them. He has refused to pass other laws for the accommodation of large districts of people unless those people would relinquish the right of representation in the legislature, a right inestimable to them and formidable only to tyrants. He has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the depository of their public records for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with his measures. He has dissolved representative houses repeatedly for opposing with manly firmness his invasions on the rights of the people. He has refused for a long time after such dissolutions to cause others to be elected whereby the legislative powers incapable of annihilation have returned to the people at large for their exercise, the state remaining in the meantime exposed to all the dangers of invasion from without and convulsions within. He has endeavored to prevent the population of these states, for that purpose obstructing the laws for naturalization of foreigners, refusing to pass others to encourage their migrations hither, and raising the conditions of new appropriations of lands. He has obstructed the administration of justice by refusing his assent to laws for establishing judiciary powers. He has made judges dependent on his will alone for the tenure of their offices and the amount and payment of their salaries. He has erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. He has kept among us in times of peace standing armies without the consent of our legislatures. He has affected to render the military independent of and superior to the civil power. He has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our constitution and unacknowledged by our laws, giving his assent to their acts of pretended legislation. For quartering large bodies of armed troops among us. For protecting them by a mock trial from punishment for any murders which they should commit on the inhabitants of these states. For cutting off our trade with all parts of the world. For imposing taxes on us without our consent. For depriving us in many cases of the benefits of trial by jury. For transporting us beyond seas. 
to be tried for pretended offenses, for abolishing the free system of English laws in a neighboring province, establishing therein an arbitrary government, and enlarging its boundaries so as to render it at once an example and fit instrument for introducing the same absolute rule into these colonies. For taking away our charters, abolishing our most valuable laws, and altering fundamentally the forms of our governments. For suspending our own legislatures and declaring themselves invested with power to legislate for us in all cases whatsoever. He has abdicated government here by declaring us out of his protection and waging war against us. He has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burnt our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. He is, at this time, transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries to complete the works of death, desolation, and tyranny, already begun with circumstances of cruelty and perfidy, scarcely paralleled in the most barbarous ages, and totally unworthy of the head of a civilized nation. He has constrained our fellow citizens taken captive on the high seas to bear arms against their country, to become the executioners of their friends and brethren, or to fall themselves by their hands. He has excited domestic insurrections amongst us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. Nor have we been wanting in attentions to our British brethren. We have warned them from time to time of attempts by their legislature to extend an unwarrantable jurisdiction over us. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our immigration and settlement here. We have appealed to their native justice and magnanimity. And we have conjured them by the ties of our common kindred to disavow these usurpations which would inevitably interrupt our connections and correspondence. They too have been deaf to the voice of justice and of consanguinity. We must, therefore, acquiesce in the necessity which denounces our separation and hold them, as we hold the rest of mankind, enemies in war, in peace, friends. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America, in general Congress assembled, appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do in the name and by authority of the good people of these colonies solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states. That they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown. And that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. And that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce. And to do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. So now you heard the reading of the Declaration of Independence, and there's definitely some things in there um, to discuss in future sessions, particularly um, when we talk about who or what is freedom and how it addresses our native people. And neither of those are really signs of everyone being free. So jo back to Mr. John Hancock here, who signed the document he also said there, his majesty can now read my name without glasses, and he can double the reward on my head. This taunting was really with his life. Um, he would have been executed had the war been lost and had he been caught. 
Benjamin Franklin was also one of the Committee of Five, which wrote what is known as the Declaration of Independence. While we give credit to Mr. Jefferson, there were others that were part of the writing team. Thomas Jefferson is given credit as probably kind of like the editor-in-chief role. When about to sign in Hancock, one of his colleagues probably said, we must be unanimous. There must be no polling different ways. We must all hang together. Yes, replied Franklin, we must hang together or we will be pretty sure to hang separately. So in this context, hanging together, being one team, if they failed, they would have all hung on trees or in town squares or in gallows. They knew the consequences of what they were about to do. We're going to finish off with some schoolhouse rock today. And then we'll be returning to the Google Classroom for any further assignment. Ooh, there's gonna be fireworks, fireworks. on the 4th of July. Red, white, and blue. Red, white, and blue fireworks like diamonds in the sky. Gonna shoot, shoot the entire the works on fireworks that really show. Oh yeah, we declared our liberty two hundred years ago. Yeah. In 1776, fireworks. there were fireworks too. The original colonists, you know, their tempers blue. Like Thomas Paine once wrote, it's only common sense. That if a government won't give you your basic rights, you better get another government. And though some people tried to fight it, well, a committee was formed to write it. Benjamin Franklin, Philip Livingston, John Adams, Roger Sherman, Thomas Jefferson, they got it done. The Declaration, uh -huh, the Declaration of Independence in 1776. Continental Congress said that we were free. Said we had the right of life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Ooh, when England heard the news, they blew their stack. But the colonists lit the fuse. There'd be no turning back. It had enough of injustice now, but even if it really hurts, oh yeah, if you don't give us our freedom now, you're gonna see some fireworks. And on the 4th of July, they signed it, and 56 names underlined it. And now to honor those first 13 states, we turn the sky into a birthday cake. They got it done. The Declaration, uh -huh, the Declaration of Independence in 1776. Continental Congress said that we were free. Said we had the right of life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. <laughs> and if there's one thing that makes me happy, then you know that it's <gasps> there's gonna be fireworks. We've now reached the conclusion of this cinematic thriller. Hopefully you learned a little bit about the Declaration of Independence. There's still a lot to discuss. At this point, you should return to the Google Classroom, complete any assignment, and be willing and ready to discuss this in a future class session. Have a minute, Gijigad. Minwa. Bama P.